this. I said, you know, maybe I should do this. Maybe we should start out the night clear, and as time goes on, we'll just get a little fuzzier, right? You know, I mean, we could have, we could have a little fun with it, but uh, so. Well, you know, my original concept of this was that everybody that came on was supposed to take a shot right at the beginning, oh. and then and then kind of sip on whatever, and we see how things go as we there progress you go. through. There you go. <laughs> But I didn't think that, you know, getting drunk on something that I was pushing out on LinkedIn. With yeah, probably not the company's best brand strategy, and, but you never know. I mean, yeah, it, it, I didn't think that I would get that many takers in doing something like that from a corporate standpoint. So, sure. I don't think TrueFit would well, care. I, I have whiskey, so. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I, I got some wood I'm for I'm going to pour it. I've got a late night, so the coffee was kind of necessary for me to get the cobwebs out right now. Understood. Well, this is awesome. Tim, it's a, it's a pleasure to finally meet you. Absolutely. Um, love the background. Is that Thank is that you. work or is that home? This is my home. This is my bar in my basement. Look at that. See, I, my bar is not as fancy as that. Yours looks like you've got some good stuff back there. I do. I have uh, some uh, good whiskey. I love scotch, uh, a couple of bourbons. But... That's awesome, man. I'm a scotch fan, too. What's your go-to? Oban? Uh, scotch. Yeah, scotch. My favorite scotch is Oban. Um, oh, Oban. And then, I thought you uh, said bourbon, and I was like, no, not bourbon, scotch. No, but yeah, yes, Oban. I like Oban, too. And Glendronic. As a matter of fact... Um, the worst part of COVID for me is in June of last year, I was scheduled to take my dad to Scotland for a week. And I had picked all of my favorite distilleries and had um, distillery tours at each of them. And we were going to play some golf and we were going to stay in some castles and drink some scotch. Um, my goodness the worst part of this is that getting canceled that's terrible man and are you is it <laughs> do you have a plan to go back out there or it's tbd i'm, I'm hopeful that uh in 2022 here we'll be able to get back out there so that that's yeah. the current plan maybe june of next year that's incredible man. that that's on my bucket list absolutely sure. it was funny I, my wife and i were trying to pick vacation spots and I threw out Scotland and she's like, no, you want to go to Scotland to golf? <laughs> and scotch. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> she's like, take your dad. I'm like, Doug. <laughs> What's so what she in? Is she in like the beach scene and, and, or is she more like the Paris shopping scene? You know, she is more the beach scene. Um, she used to golf. We used to golf a lot uh, before kids, but then kids ruined all that. So um Those so she was kids. but uh but yeah she is more hanging out um going to uh the pool and seeing sights sitting back on the beach and having a mai tai there you go that's awesome that's awesome yeah my wife is uh my wife's not the biggest fan of the beach she will she'll travel she likes to having the experiences and going and seeing new places but uh, the beach is not her favorite thing. She'd rather be she'd rather be in the shopping district than anywhere else. So there you go. She will down some whiskey with me though. She, <laughs> uh, I that was that was one of the one of the success keys of the pandemic for us was that she uh, she dipped into my whiskey collection and um, progressively made her way up. And now she can she can hang with me if I'm drinking something. She's like, oh, let me try it. And before she was she was all about the vodka and the tequila um of course she's hispanic so that that makes sense there you go. <laughs> awesome so um we can hop in man it is a it's a pleasure to have you guys on thank you so much um chris it's it's always good to see you and talk to you tim again it's a pleasure to meet you man um let's get started and Tim, you and I have, this is the first time that we've ever seen each other and spoken to each other. So this whole thing, super informal, really laid back, really relaxed. Um, I want to understand your individual histories, like how you guys got to where you are today at Inateskis. Um, and then I want to understand Inateskis history, right? How that, 
how that came to be. And I know there's a little bit of chem image in there that that's helped get you guys to where you are. Um, you know, the, the nature of this podcast and, and our network here is IoT. Um, computer imaging um, is a huge piece of IoT. And I think a lot of people don't really think about the data annotization um, as a big component of IoT, but it really is. So if you guys can help us tie what you do within Ateskis into what's out there and some of the applications for it specific to IoT, um, I think that'd be really, really interesting. And Chris is showing a video. What is that, man? That looks awesome. Yeah, it's like one of these things running in real time on a video camera. So you talk about IoT. This is a Raspberry Pi form factor device. Okay. That can actually do this at 30 frames per second real time. Wow. And this is an early version of um, a neural network architecture called MobileNet V2. Um, and if you look there, it's telling you that it's only 70% to 95% certain I'm a person. Um, you know, a cell phone and a, a cup of coffee. But it's kind of interesting. Neat. I just figured I'd throw these in here in case conversation went that way. We want to throw something. So. No, I love it, man. And and do that. Like I said, this is super informal. So you popping up little stuff like that makes it uh, makes it really yeah, interesting. You don't want me to be this guy, right? Like, hey. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> the infinite tunnel of faces. No, we do not want the infinite tunnel of faces. <laughs> so... But I got a couple of things in here. If the conversation goes that way, yeah. I got them. We can pop them up. I don't, you know, it's whatever you want to no, do. No, I appreciate it, guys. It, it, like it, we've been recording for the last six minutes or so. So this is all, this is all part of it. Um, Good deal. You know, uh, who wants to start? Get a little bit of history on, on how you came to be where you are today. And I guess I always mess this up. Like, tell me, tell me who you are and what you do and the company that you do it for. So I'll start with just that introduction, and then we'll allow Chris to give the backstory to Inateskis, and then we can talk about how I ended up joining the team. So um, my name's Tim Tannert. I'm the CEO of Inateskis, relatively new. We've, I've been there about five months, so um, it's been a, a fun journey so far. Uh, but Chris is really the man that, that started all of this, and um, I think he would do the best job telling the backstory. Awesome. Sure. And um, so we're in a Tescus. It's Latin for we make known and it's we in that collaborative sense. And our platform is really trying to help people develop the data that they need in order to fuel the algorithm development that's going to make their applications be successful and, and do that in an expedient manner that kind of really drives them to have a competitive advantage over a lot of other people. Um, our history um, starts with Chem Image Corporation. Um, you know, that was almost 23 years ago that I walked into Chem Image Corporation as an <laughs> intern, ended up as employee number nine, and ultimately went on to lead both the software development and information technology groups over there through the years. And um, I believe you're familiar with Chem Image uh, does, but for those who, does it, uh, who don't know, um, they build a lot of optical sensing devices. I always like to tell people that part of our job, especially in the software development practice, was part user interface, part data science, and part robotics. Because not only does ChemImage do a lot of the technology development, the research, and the algorithm development, um, they build their own sensors um, based upon the technology they developed to do hyperspectral imaging. So we worked a lot um, early on. It was in polymers and paints and then um, plastic compounds and then semiconductors, a lot of defense work over the years. 9-11 was a big shift and we were looking at a lot of um, ticks, TIMS, and potential bioagents um, out there. We did a lot of work with anthrax and lots of different things. Ultimately, um, took that technology into the explosive detection arena. We were using light to detect um, explosive materials and compounds out there. And ultimately, drug detection and other kind of compound detection. Anywhere where you really want another dimension of information other than just the imagery to kind of drive decision making. So, you know, all white powders in the corner of a room may look the same, but is it baking powder, is it anthrax, or is it cocaine? And, you know, helping by understanding the chemistry that um, is there in addition to the imagery offered a lot of power. Um, and, you know, in the process of building the software platforms there, it's a lot of computer vision, machine learning, algorithm development, science. And, you know, we were really... 
um, building a lot of not only tools for our customers and the applications, but also our internal data science team as it grew through the years. I mean, I, I was employee number nine, I believe, and, and now there's over 100 people there. So, you know, it was just kind of wow. neat to see and, and the growth over the years and just the expansion of the technology. And, you know, we found ourselves building a lot of tooling internally and, and tooling that we, we wish we could have just went out and purchased in that kind of make versus buy decision. But unfortunately, it didn't exist, um, particularly for our, our purposes. And, you know, that's really where the idea and thinking behind Inateskis got started. Nice. That's awesome. And then, uh, and Tim, your background, what's your background in? Where did you come from? So I have a unique background to get here. I'm actually a pharmacist by education. Um, and I started um, leading long-term care pharmacies, pharmacies that service nursing homes, uh, jails, um, group homes, hospice, any place where a patient was going to be there a while. And that's really where I developed my leadership abilities and my ability to grow companies. And I had the opportunity about 10 years ago now to move to Pittsburgh to come in as the chief operating officer for a Pittsburgh software company called Softwriters. And Softwriters at the time had just gotten their first round of private equity funding. They were looking to grow and scale the business. And they brought me in as the chief operating officer in order to be able to um, build that organizational infrastructure, if you will. Hmm. And um, so that has been a, a really fun ride for me. Uh, we were able to sell the company uh, about three years in. And then 18 months later, we sold again. In that time, we became part of a large publicly traded company. And um, at that point, I was promoted to CEO and ran uh, Soft Riders as a division of the publicly traded company for uh, about four years. Um, but I wanted to build. I enjoy yeah. um, being at smaller companies and scaling them. When I joined Soft Riders, we were in the 20 something employees and we took that to over 150 and, and did it quite successfully. And so I got introduced through a friend of mine to Inateskis and I was able to see what they were doing and the unbelievable technology that Chris and the team were able to build. But they were looking for someone to come in and help them build out the business development, yeah. um, marketing, sales, um, and ultimately the business processes to help us scale and grow this business rapidly. And so I joined the, the team and we're doing just that. And um, Chris really was able to start the organization with an unbelievable culture. And that's something that I give him a lot of credit for. And we've been able to just continue to build upon that. And so all of the building blocks, all of the framework uh, for really high performing, high growth organization, we're right here. And I'm mm -hmm. just um, really thrilled to be a part of the ride. You made it an easy transition for you, huh? Absolutely. It's been a lot of fun. And, you know, I've always, I joke around, I've always been considered the pharmacist that was in technology. And this gave me <laughs> an opportunity to really be a part of a, a true tech company. And, uh, you know, we're doing some really cool things, not only with the annotation piece, but the data piece. And yeah. part of, I think, our pivot here is to really think of ourselves and step as a data company instead of an annotation company. Yeah. Um, there is so much the good data, uh, whether it's unbiased, whether it's um, um, free of um, deficiencies or gaps within mm -hmm. that data that can truly drive model performance. Yeah. And I think oftentimes people um, err on the side of throwing more data at it rather than truly understanding what are the gaps, what are the biases, yep. and what the specific data that we need to have in order to be able to uh, round out our data set to drive better performance. And so that's the direction that Inateskis is taking. Yeah. And I think it's truly differentiated in the market. Um, when you couple that uh, with what we call AVA, which is our automated video annotator, uh, 
most of our competition treats video as photos. And so when you think that there's approximately um, 60 frames per second of video, and you might have hours upon hours of video, that's a lot of individual frames that would need to be annotated. And yeah. so I don't know if you can see the snow uh, border in the, the back on my screen, but um, we've been able to um, create an automated video annotator that allows you to annotate the first frame of the video and we annotate the rest of the video hmm. uh, for them. And so uh, another great Pittsburgh company is a company called RE Squared here in town. They were our alpha user of Ava and they had a new project that they were working on and had two people annotating video. Mm -hmm. And in a month, they had only been able to annotate 2,000 frames of video. Wow. We handed them Ava still in our alpha form, right? We've, we've done a lot of enhancements since then. But even with our original version, they were able to take that in, in the same amount of time, one month, that it took them to annotate 2,000 images they were able to annotate 40,000 images. And not only did they go 20X in volume and velocity, but they were able to increase the accuracy of those annotations. Wow. So 20X improvement in efficiency plus higher accuracy. And so that's the value that we bring, right? Um, people think of data as the tedious, unsexy, if you will, I hate using that term, but right <laughs> side of, of the um, machine learning computer vision space. And what we're able to do is to um, help drive efficiencies, drive quality, dramatically reduce the time spent mm -hmm. on that annotation and improve quality. Uh, the sad fact is about 90% of the work in computer vision and machine learning right now, never makes it to production. And it's because of the inability to drive the right amount of accuracy for those yeah. tools to be useful. And we believe that we can solve that problem. Well, it makes a ton of sense. Like my wife is in data. She's working for a data simulation company. It's actually a, a sponsor of this webcast called SimWell right now. They're working with some amazing globally recognized brands. Um, and her thing is always garbage in, garbage out, right? Like people people have and are sitting on these mountains of data. Um, but if the data is dirty and you're trying to pull actionable insights and forecast different things that affect either revenue generating or time efficiencies within an organization, and it's not accurate data, like you're, you're basing your entire business on on almost a house of cards, right? Or, it's or, just, or maybe you don't have the domain expertise to interpret the data. And it, it really comes down to all those different things to be able to turn data. Da data in alone is just noisy. It's a raw yeah. resource. I always like to use the Pittsburgh term, right? It's a resource that we dig. It's an ore that we have to dig out of the ground and we have to refine and process it yeah. to get it into those girders and steel beams that we can go put into skyscrapers and bridges and, and all the other things and wonderful things that can happen from yeah. it. But you got to have that fundamental solid kind of engineering background of making sure you understand what is in the data, what comprises yeah. the data and where it's going. So, you know, we are big believers in garbage in, garbage out. For sure, man. And talk about being in the right place at the right time uh, with what you guys are doing. And the fact that, I mean, data is everybody's talking about data. There is an organization out there that's not having a data conversation, right? Absolutely. But in... Machine learning, it's almost like people have given up, right? Because you hear this term, it's a black box, right? And when it's a black box, right, there you have no access, you have no visibility. And so we like to say that we're illuminating the black box of machine learning, right? We're, we're helping people uh, truly understand what they have and how they have it with intuitive tools that make the data visualization unbelievably simple. And mm -hmm. so that's the other piece of this is our user experience um, and the ability to uh, quickly 
get to the insights that you need is something that fantastic of being able to create. Yeah. Man, that's awesome. So Chris, tell me, tell me your hit. Like, what's your past? Where where do you come from? I know Chem Image, 23 years, but like I know Tim Tim came from the pharmacy world. Where did you come from? And then kind of transition that and, and share the technology behind in a test test. Oh, where to begin? Um, I kind of <laughs> had a non-traditional background, to be completely honest with you. You know, that is that has been a a <laughs> constant theme in these webcasts. When right. I ask this question, nobody has a traditional way of getting to where they've been. No, and you know, when I was when I was a kid, I thought I was going to be in um, an aviation, you know, aerospace engineer or avionics. Is it was the plan? And I actually had been yeah. accepted to Ember Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida had a hotel room, or I'm sorry, a, 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 a <laughs> dorm room. <laughs> sorry, drink another one, Chris. Um, you know, had, had, had a dorm room, all the rest of that, mailbox. Of um, unfortunately, life led me down a path that I was, I was going to be unfortunate and could not attend uh, Ember-Riddle. And, it, you know, it was always my dream to be a pilot and always had a fascination between electronics and computers and those sorts of things. Um, Ultimately, I decided that uh, I was going to go to a local university and do my GE and kind of, um, you know, kind of do some of the groundwork while I could get into a position where I could go and do that thing. You know, we're all you know, young, young and bright eyed and all the rest of that. And I'm standing in line signing up for classes. And a lady said to me, wow, you have a really nice voice. You should be in broadcasting. And I said, what's broadcasting? And believe it or not, I went down this pra uh, track and get it, got real involved in uh, broadcast engineering, multi-track recording, uh, eventually passed my SBE or Society Broadcast Engineering certification and was licensed to go work in radio and television stations at the time. I did a little bit of work in um, a local affiliated, uh, I guess at the time, you'd call it NPR today, it was APR back then, uh, affiliate station with the university. I worked there for a while um, and ultimately got into doing pro audio sales. Um, I sold reel-to-reel -reel tape before digital in Burbank uh, to places like Disney and Todd Ayo Studios and a lot of facilities that were doing um, kind of work for movies in the recording industry. And it was right at the cusp when everybody was going digital. Now, I, I say all this. I'd been writing code since I was nine years old. We were building networks uh, in my living room uh, in the early 90s so we could play Wolfenstein 3D and Doom. And um, I really set up a 3D render farm because we had some grand ambitions of doing all this CG computer designed art at the time. And that kind of really set my, my passion into kind of uh, imagery and processing and kind of the things that happened. And lo and behold, I taught myself this thing called HTML and uh, learned how to do some web programming and actually was doing web development in the early 90s where I was converting documents into um, things that would be content on a website back then. And I said, hey, you know, this web thing may take off. And people are like, you're, you're crazy. Whoever's going to want to buy anything online, nobody's ever going to want to do that, right? And decided to switch careers. Um, ultimately decided, um, you know, audio was going to be a tough slog. Still have a, um, a love for it, as you can tell by the microphone. But, um, <laughs> you know, kind of just continued to slog through it. And I decided to go back to school for web and multimedia and kind of um, interactive media technologies at the time. And there was one of two places in the country. It was in San Francisco or here, and I chose here in Pittsburgh. And I, wow. um, at first, I really regretted the decision. And um, <laughs> uh, coming from Southern California to Pittsburgh in winter time, very was, and without as, a jacket, as we've seen and, last week and a half, where this is the yeah. first sunny day we had in six days. Yeah, and so it was a big shock. I thought I was on the surface of the moon, and w whatever <laughs> did I do? And um, my plan was to immediately after graduating school to go right back to Southern California in the sun and the fun. And um, unfortunately, I fell into this place called Chem Image Corporation as an intern. And uh, my plans were dramatically changed after that. Wow. Well, I, I just, worked. honestly, it's one of my, what was that, Tim? I was going to say he also worked in virtual reality. I, I mean, did. I've worked a lot of jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could say I was a valet, I bagged groceries, um, I worked in a, a location-based virtual reality entertainment center in Old Town Pasadena, um, where my name was Unfit, I still have my badge somewhere, I had long hair, braids, and a Viking helmet, 
And my oh job was to dress in a lab coat and take people on an adventure in another dimension. And so it was kind of fun. Actually, you know, I got to do a lot of really interesting things in that job. I met Stephen Hawking um, as he was Come visiting on. Caltech. He came in. Um, I was on Spanish TV with the Pink Power Ranger. Um, Meredith Baxter Bernie stole my lighter when she was uh, lighting the birthday uh, candles on her child's cake. Um, so we got to do a lot, meet a lot of interesting people. It was a, a, a early buzz in um, Pasadena at the time. But I mean, I've done everything under the sun. Like I said, I worked valet, I did a little stint at Victoria's Secrets. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I literally have I dabbled. I, that's going to be a story everything. for another time, I think. Yeah, that's when, the next so podcast. When we meet in person, and yeah, that's the next podcast. We're going to hear the story. <laughs> about <laughs> uh, <laughs> going to go into the, the pink. Like Ranger, I said, non traditional background. <laughs> non traditional background. It really is fascinating. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why I even started this whole webcast, like the concept of hearing individual stories, because I think people a lot of the times see somebody like Tim or Chris, like they see you guys and they're and they associate you with the company that you work for. They associate you with Chem Image or Soft Writers or Inateskis. And there's so much more to your individual story than just that. And those are stories I think they get lost. And so I'm, I'm ecstatic that you guys have shared this with me. And um, like, it's fascinating to me how you got here. Uh, so, so, okay, I'm off my soapbox. Chris, <laughs> tell us a little bit about the technology in, in a Tescus. And, and this is a time for you to shine. And if you got videos and things like that, like show them how, how is that applicable? to the internet of things sure so you know the internet of things is something that's near and dear to my heart i'm a bit of a gadget freak as most ctos probably are out there or or you know in tech companies like this and you know i've kind of always explored things i have google glass i have the predecessor epson glasses you know i, I have all these devices and like just to experiment and play with them sometimes i like to get two one to play with and one to tear apart and just kind of see how these things operate and what they behave and really what they comprised of and, and that's really exciting to me. And, you know, understanding and being in an organization like ChemImage, where it was a lot of algorithm development, it's a lot of computer vision, and seeing the need that our data science team had, our, our, our computer vision and machine learning engineers had in needing high quality annotated data, we just knew there was better tooling that could be made out there. And, and you know, that's a reoccurring thing that we hear with a lot of our customers saying, look, we try to do it ourselves, but this isn't our core business, right? Um, you know, we know there's other people out there do it, or we tried to cobble together some open source packages to do what we want, but it just really didn't fit the bill. And so we, we knew the value in the data, but it goes beyond annotation. Annotation is like the beginning, the, the necessary evil to enable all the rest of the things to happen. Because yeah. I, I, I really believe in that garbage in, garbage out. And, you know, understanding the data, having the understanding of what comprises your data, what potential hidden biases there may be in the data to just help drive better quality data, fueling the algorithm development that you need. Um, I think, you know, Andrew Ang said, you know, data is that food, right, that fuels AI. And, you know, do you want healthy food or do you want junk food? Um, and they're both going to have different effects on the impact of your body. Mm. And, you know, just the same thing with the data. Um, or do you want good data or do you just want data in mass? And, you know, there's a certain amount of thinking out there that we could just do data at mass. And uh, then, geez, on, we have all this data. I don't understand it. And I'm going to start creating fake data from it. And I just amplify these biases and issues within my problems. And then I wonder why I get into these scenarios when my model isn't quite performing how I think it should or at the performance levels I want it to. And, and you got to go back and look at, well, why is that happening? And it always goes back to the beginning, right? It's a vicious cycle where we got to go back to the beginning and understand what comprises our data, um, what kind of imbalances may be in the data, and really what are what things, out of all the things you can measure and understand, what really is meaningful to my application? And that's a judgment call. That's a, a data science team. But we always envision that we had these technologies and, and capabilities that could just really help the teams that need to turn that imagery and video into the fuel for their algorithm developments. And, you know, a big kudo in our caps, um, you know, to put our money where our mouth is, um, we joined um, the Andrew Ng uh, Data Centric AI Challenge. Uh, he kicked it off. It was a very different AI challenge than a lot of what you see in Kaggle and a lot of these other places where folks are competing on the algorithm design and the model design, 
to kind of, you know, you were tweaking hyperparameters to get to the highest performing solution. And, you know, this one was a step back saying, if we hold all the parameters in the model fixed, what can we do to the data in order to drive model performance? Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, that's right in our wheelhouse. We're like, okay, well, we, we're going to take a stab at this. And unbeknownst to us, uh, our third um, submission took number one in the leaderboard and sat there for 30 days until we were bumped out by 0. 0.00008 uh, uh, points <laughs> uh, at the final days of the competition. But it was wow. really exciting. We got to, you know, again, I think we showed a lot of people what was possible with yeah. the types of data. We had a certain approach to it. It was very interesting to be in this pool of people. And and really, the best part about it all is we got to meet Andrew Ng on a round table and <laughs> hang out with a guy and talk for an hour. And you can see uh, there's Chris in there and Tim's in there and Shashank and um, Rob Walsh, our other founders at Inatesca. So that was really exciting. Had, it was a highlight for me um you know getting to meet the guy and just understand and you know it's funny we had that conversation about um how the data wrangling and curation and, and data centric tasks aren't always the fun part of the job um, but often necessary and, and he kind of yeah. laughed and, and uh, remarked about how in the early days of deep learning nobody wanted to mess around with the internals of the neural network architecture <laughs> now that's the hot new thing right so maybe we're just ahead of our time and people don't realize it you know Again, I, I liken it back to being solid engineering practices. And with the, you know, in relation to IoT, the, you know, that data and the prevalence of all these kind of, um, uh, you know, Raspberry Pi devices and small form factor devices with a lot of compute on them to do this kind of stuff on the edge. I think that's what's really exciting and enable yeah. a lot of applications that we're just beginning to fathom. And I kind of started going into that, you know, this is a device I own. Mm -hmm. I picked it up about three years ago. It's called a Coral. It's from Google. And it ex can accelerate um, TensorFlow models um, through the use of TensorFlow Lite and kind of quantitizing and integer math and some other magic under the hood. I won't go too deep into that. But um, <laughs> allows us to do things very quickly at the, on an edge type device. And again, this is mm -hmm. a Raspberry Pi form factor. And I was kind of showing this earlier, but uh, you know, what can we do with this? Well, you hook it up to a web camera and now I can do object classification um, at 30 frames per second off a live stream. And this was real fun. We had some code that did this. This is me in one of our old offices when I first got this thing up and running. This was literally three years ago. And the technology wow. has just progressed where um, the models and the architectures to do these things are much more robust. And we're getting to the time where we kind of have pre-built, you know, people have general, if you want to do classification on imagery, we have these certain model architectures that work really well mm -hmm. on the classes they were trained on. But if we want to train them to do new tricks, right, it's um, make them do new tasks, we have to show it a new corpus of data to enable it to learn that thing. So you can kind of think of, um, sure, it's really good at detecting person, cell phone, coffee cup, but what about cancer? Is, is that malignant? Or uh, what is the species of fish in this particular image, right? And, yeah. and those are the tasks these architectures had never seen. So they need to be retrained on that particular data or what we call transfer learning, where we can take a new corpus of data, annotated data that has the information it needs and train these architectures that were good at finding people to find fish. Right. And, and that's a, that's a big, you know, push forward. And, you know, there's just a ton of these things. This is a, a NVIDIA Jetson Nano. Um, you can do all kinds of cool stuff on this. We talked to a number of people that do run this. This runs full TensorFlow, has GPU type capabilities. Um, and ultimately this is transitioning to stuff that's available today where you have a low cost COTS product like this 4K camera that has an Intel chip on it that can do inference and prediction. So I can actually run 30 frames per second prediction mm -hmm on a USB-C small little form factor web camera. And you know, that's just super cool stuff when to me is it's gonna enable a lot more people to do things. But again, in order to train the models that you run on these things or in order to be useful, all really start with the, the data that we, um, the data set that you create and annotate and curate and understand and ultimately build high quality fuel uh, to go in the tank. It, it really does blow my mind the fact that, you know, three years ago, you the video that you showed, I mean, it, it, just the capabilities, right? The, Of course, COVID slammed a lot of the manufacturing and components and things like that. But I mean, over the past two decades, technology, chips, 
manufacturing components and things like that have gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And so it's allowed, I mean, the Raspberry Pis, for example, incredibly powerful, little cost effective uh, computer. Um, you know, it's just, it, it blows my mind the abilities that, that are out there and capabilities that are out there. If folks just take the time to build the things like it's, it's there, it's ready Absolutely. for you. Absolutely. And there's a lot of pre-built scaffolding out there to do it now, you know, not for every application and you can think of all kinds of things. And, you know, that's the fun part of it, being able to dream about the possibilities and the potentials, because we see all kinds of applications from consumer goods through healthcare to, mil you know, defense. To I mean, there right? it's, I mean, it's endless. <laughs> right. um, but, you know, a lot of it is we got to be ethical about what we're doing, too. You sure. want to understand the data so that we're making the appropriate decisions and, conduct. you know, so minimizing those biases, really understanding what comprises your data. And I think that's one of the unique things about the Inateska's platform is, in addition to annotation, we can start providing you those other insights. Now, I can't tell you whether A or B is good or bad for your particular application. That, that That's kind of the subject matter experts and the people closer to what they're doing are, but we can provide you these deep, rich tools to kind of enlighten you and help guide you and make tactical decisions about where you're going. Yeah. No, that I, I, I get it, man. It's amazing. Um, and like we're at the cusp, right? I mean, as technology continues to go down this path, it's just going to um, continue uh, to get easier to do those things. I, so let's take a minute, and we've talked about the technology, um, kind of peel back some of the layers of the onions of applications, some of the things um, that you guys are, are working on today, um, where where do you see this technology really kind of taking root into the future? And Tim, this so, may be great. This may be a great question for you. Yeah, absolutely. And so the one thing I would add on to the Andrew N competition before we go there is there are like a couple of thousand, I think, some people over two thousand entries. Over two thousand people that that participated in that, um, and. The reality is every single one of them was recreating the wheel, right? No one has a commercially available product to be able to do the things that are necessary in order to truly to drive model performance with quality data. And yeah. so that's our opportunity. That's our niche. And um, so all of the information and knowledge and everything that we've done to come in second place in that worldwide competition, we are providing to our customers a, um, a very approachable price to be able to um, have pre-made tools to truly improve their, their model performance. So that's one thing I would say. From an application standpoint, that's truly been the fun part of the job for me is all of the different types of organizations that I've been able to talk to um, and have seen how they are, are using our product. And so we have um, national home security companies that are looking to identify items within the video of your home security system, right? Is Let it your you? imagination wander on what that is? Exactly, right? <laughs> you, not you. Is there a, um, a package that's been delivered to your front door? How many packages, right? Who knows what they're doing with that, but there are a lot of opportunities there, right? To um, smart retail. Amazon Go has created stores out West, right? Where you take your phone, you scan it like a, mobile boarding pass to get onto an airplane. As you walk into the Amazon Go store, they immediately know who you are and what your Amazon account is. And then you can go and put anything you want in the cart or quite frankly, your pocket, right? And walk out the store and you're yeah. automatically billed for that. And so yeah. when you start to think about how much uh, lost profits there are with shrink, due to theft in retail and the potential to completely eliminate that or mostly eliminate that through computer vision, it's quite powerful. Um, 
Don't, oh, no, don't forget the, the edib ed edible bugs. Right, absolutely. So <laughs> this is one of the more bizarre applications, right, is we have a customer that is harvesting and growing insects for protein sources and food. for human consumption for human consumption right and i mean um, we're one of the very few countries that don't eat bugs on a exactly. regular basis apparently so. it's a green <laughs> form of protein so it but, is. and and you know. with that then you need to know what's the ratio of male to female insects right in order to be able to uh, produce more insects and you need to um, look for signs of agitation or disease within that population, right? To, um, we have agriculture that is um, using our software to, on a conveyor system to identify seeds that will either mm. grow or not grow based off of the color of the seed. Right. Yeah. So based off of that, they can understand the quality of the seeds that they're sure. producing, what's the potential um, yield of the harvest uh, to, um, you know, smart retail as far as looking at fashion trends and trying to look at what's available on the market for fashions, who are wearing what designers or colors wow. or styles to try to predict the fashion trends um, for the next season, right? Because that allows the designers and uh, developers and creators to yeah. get ahead of that. There are so many unbelievable applications of this technology. We really believe that it's going to revolutionize each industry. And, um, and that's what's exciting about it. And I think that it's going to improve the quality of our lives. Um, and pretty soon, you know, within, I don't know, a decade, two decades, every organization is going to have a data scientist. Every organization yep. is going to have uh, machine learning. Um, it, it becomes a ticket to entry. Yeah. And, um, and that's what's been fun. And, and to see these unbelievably innovative companies and how they're using their creativity and imagination to be able to solve their customers problems um, hmm. it's fun to be a part of that so uh, and and that's incredible because there are so many different avenues for you guys to kind of go in and as a new company um my question is how do you like how do you find the needle in the haystack how do you sift through the opportunities and really find the things that to sink your teeth into that are like, this is, you know, it, with what we do at Truefit, right? It's that iterative development. It's, it's finding the path of least resistance. It's finding those features that we need to develop that are really going to take that product forward. Before we develop the wants, let's develop the needs. How do you find those, those products or those industries that you guys add the most value to now so that you can continue to grow in the future? Absolutely. And so I think there's two pieces of that question from my perspective. One is how do we find the right target market today? And then two, how do we um, build the right features and functions within our product to carve our own industry? And so right. one of the things that we preach at Inatascus is that we are not um, a Me Too product, we are the ones creating the industry. And we believe that within, you know, every ounce of ourselves. And mm -hmm. so um, being able to understand um, the landscape, understand the real challenges that data scientists and um, computer vision professionals and companies are having to be able to get their, their models to production that, you know, 90% failure rate. And not only is there a 90% failure rate, but 80% of the time that they're spending is on the data, yeah. right? And so if we can improve that, and if we can um, improve that model performance and get them to production, we know that we can um, really create a great company and, and great uh, services for our customers. As far as finding that right target niche, right? That is the million dollar question for us. And we are focused more on title. We are mm -hmm. focused more on company size. Um, and we are trying to target 
first companies that are already doing this because we can't convince a large organization or any organization the, the value of transforming their product to utilize computer <laughs> vision, right? Um, but who's already using computer vision? And then look at the, the right size. I think that um, a lot of the smaller companies look at some of this data collection, annotation, and it's cost prohibitive. Um, yeah. And it, it not only is it time consuming, it's ridiculously expensive. And so yeah. that's our first niche, right, is to be able to bring superior technologies and data to companies that are more uh, smaller to middle market. Um, and then from the, the bigger companies perspective, we believe that the data visualization is really the key for us, that yeah. our competitors are focused on the act of annotation and providing them the data. They're really not focused on making sure that it's the right data and that it's truly gonna improve their model performance. And so we think of ourselves almost as the Swiss army knife in this field, we have like the ability that. to import all of the major annotation platforms in the um, in our space. Mm -hmm. And so I don't care who annotated your data and I don't care what software your data was annotated in. We're giving you the ability to import that data into our platform and then we can visualize it for you. We mm -hmm. can help augment that data and we can help you you make it better. And so those are really the, the different ways that we're approaching the market um, that I think bring tremendous value. Man, that's awesome. Chris, you, you, anything to add there? No, I mean, again, it's the thing that's amazed me is just the diversity in the application space. And, um, you know, it's kind of really neat to see. And I, I do believe that some of our best customers and biggest customers probably don't even exist today because this is a set, such a fast growing space. Yeah. Um, you know, lots of startups, uh, more traditional companies that are now dabbling their toe into here as they kind of see this pay dividends for others. So uh, I'm just really excited about in general, um, kind of seeing the technology mature and where it can go. Um, yeah. You know, being that technology, uh, I'm, I'm a super nerd, to be honest with you. You know, I, <laughs> I, I like those types of things. That's what excites me. And I like playing with these Raspberry Pis and all the rest of that to see what's possible. And then, you know, know that there's other dreamers out there like me that are yeah. trying to do the same thing at, at a commercial scale. And, you know, where, where we can really help is them building that data set to be able to do these things uh, in a very efficient fashion and, and truly using good engineering practices, right? Understand yeah. your data, crap in, crap out. Let's have a balanced data set. Let's be able to generalize across a, a number of various scenarios and, and, and just do our due diligence there. And if we can help you do that sooner, faster, um, to drive those exciting applications you're working on, that's great. I don't mind yeah. being the man behind the curtain. You know what I mean? If, if, if we can support these organizations doing uh, the work that they do exceedingly well, um, I'm very excited about that. I, I, I really like being a service to those people. Yeah, I, you said you said you used the word excited, and uh, and it's weird because even going into this conversation and hearing you guys and hearing the passion and hearing where you are, the opportunity in the markets, the types of things you know, standard and abnormal, that you guys have the ability to kind of inject into and to help and to fix and to to work on, it's a very exciting product in a very exciting time in technology as a whole and an exciting time in Pittsburgh and having you guys be here in Pittsburgh. I mean, like it's the perfect storm um, of, of opportunity and, you know, time in and preparation and all of that stuff. It's all culminated into what you guys have today at in Ateskis. And I'm excited. I'm excited to hear, like, I hope that we talk a year from now and you're like, Hey, like we're, we're in this industry and we're doing this product and we never even thought about this, but we're over here doing this stuff. And, you know, and I can see even in the conversations, Chris, that you and I have had over the last what year or so, mm -hmm. like that's the direction that that you guys are going. So, well, you know, again, and as, I was say, as I was saying earlier, you know, coming from Southern California, I moved to Pittsburgh and went, what the heck did I do? Was this the right decision <laughs> for me? And now in hindsight, um, like 25 years later, 
it, it was the perfect decision for me. I was it. Sometimes a, a, it a takes key, a little bit of time, right? Well, you know, a lot of times fate has a way of nudging you into where you need yep. to be with the people you need to be with. And yeah. you know, all things considered, and the diversity of backgrounds, it was just Pittsburgh's a very interesting city to me. Um, that ultimately became my home, and I love it. Right? Um, yeah. I don't see myself living in Southern California again. I do miss the weather at times, especially this time of year. But hey, it's a great place to visit. You know, um, <laughs> there's a lot of exciting things happening. I mean, I remember when I first moved here, seeing abandoned steel mills and all the rest of that, and now seeing the vibrant tech scene mm -hmm. and all the growth that's occurred in the space and you know, when, when I first moved here, it was about the brain drain, right? Everybody's leaving Pittsburgh. Now it's what is the new exciting startup of the week or three new yeah. exciting startups of the week. And yep. it's just very exciting to see. And I just think Pittsburgh's at a, a unique confluence, if you will, of, um, you know, all those things coming together with tech and the exciting things and um, that are happening here. And I, I'm just, you know, again, I think it's the perfect place at the perfect time. Yeah. When you think of the great organizations that are helping to support this here in Pittsburgh, right? From a startup perspective, you have Rust Built and the, the great things that Kit, they're doing. Kit's doing an amazing job over there. He really it, is. It, it's fantastic, right? And you've got the Pittsburgh Robotics Network that is um, bringing uh, thought leaders together and looking at how we can continue to cultivate the, the, the companies and the knowledge and, and the people that we have here in Pittsburgh. And um, I'll tell you, I think it's the place to be. And um, we're thrilled to be a part of this ecosystem. And they have so many smart people um, around us to be able to talk to and network with and rely on. And so, um, you know, we're, we're thrilled to be here. Yeah, I, I think there's there's the old, age old adage that talks about show me your friends and I'll show you who you become. That Pittsburgh is becoming a place that, that other people want to be a part of um, because of the experiences of those that have been here before. Um, Pittsburgh's not always made the right decisions. We've learned from the mistakes um, of the past, and it's exciting to see um, the progression. Um, for me, I grew up an hour south of here in Connellsville. Lyson Ring is a little patch community that I grew up in across the street from Coke Ovens. Um, you know, I used to I used to walk through Coke Ovens as a kid um, and, uh, you know, lived in a duplex a majority of my life and, and seeing what our area is becoming um, as somebody that was born and raised either either living a living a life in retail or as a mechanic or in the mines. And now seeing you grow up, say, you know what? I can be in tech and I can become an engineer robotics or and a doctor. I can get into robotics or a doctor. I mean, it's it's absolutely phenomenal for um, for our region. And I'm excited to just be a, a minuscule, small, itty bitty part of it. Um, so uh, thank you guys so much. Before we wrap up, we're at about 52 minutes and this has been this has been an amazing conversation. Um, I always ask this, what is something that our listeners can do um, to help you guys push the needle forward? What are the types of introductions you're looking for? What are the types of things that you're needing? Is it hiring? Is it is it introductions in certain industries? Like, what are you looking for? How can we help you guys push the agenda of Inateskas forward? You know, for us right now, I think it's just introductions to any companies that are currently or thinking about utilizing computer vision. Because um, I, I think we can bring tremendous value to a very reasonable price for them. Yeah. And so um, those are the types of um, introductions I think would be the most helpful. Okay. Chris? I just like talking shop with people. So if you're <laughs> interested in this kind of space and just want to have a conversation, whether you're an intern or a student or a CEO, uh, feel free to reach out and I'll be more than willing to have that conversation with you and talk about what the possibilities and could be, right? Awesome. Chris Anderson, Tim Tanner with Inateskas, thank you guys so much for, uh, for just spending some time in your evening, taking time away from your family and drinking and hanging out with me. Greatly appreciated. Um, looking forward to hearing what you guys do in the future. Uh, it, it's amazing. So thanks for thanks for being on tonight. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you, Alex. Well. Appreciate yeah, having cheers. us. Thank yeah, you. Cheers. Cheers.
Here's I'm, I, I've had three, so this is <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> oh my! Yeah.